Welcome everyone. I'm Sam Toby, the gallery director of the University Hall Gallery at UMass Boston. Thank you for joining us tonight for our last online artist talk for, of this challenging year, 2020. As always, our exhibitions and events are free and open to the public. This program is brought to you with the support of the, of the art department and the College of Liberal Arts at UMass Boston and the generous support of the Paul Hayes Tucker Fund and the Paul and Edith Babson Foundation. So it seems appropriate tonight to be celebrating the work of Evan Haynes and Delaney Dameron, the co-curators and creators of the Shelter in Place Gallery. As they will discuss in their artist talk, their multifaceted curatorial project, architectural sculpture and social practice artwork was recently acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts Boston for their collection. Uh, so I wanna congratulate Evan and Delaney on this important achievement in their, in their practices um, and thank them for the amazing exhibitions and experiences uh, that you've been able to produce during this otherwise very difficult year for public art and exhibitions. Um, so congratulations and thank you very much for, for both those things. Thank you. thank you, thanks for having us tonight. Yeah, of course, it's a pleasure. Um, tonight, Delaney and Evan will be discussing the origin of, and trajectory of this inspiring work, after which we will, we will open to a Q&A where viewers can interject with questions and comments, um, which I'll field for them. The program should last about an hour with some room to expand. Um, before we get started, I just want to lay out some context uh, for the gallery and its initiative. Uh, it, was, it was almost nine months ago now, on March 11th, when UMass Boston and the, and the many other regional educational institutions um, in the area closed their campuses at the onset of the first wave of the coronavirus, hoping to stem its spread. The day after, the day after Boston and Cambridge's four major art museums, the Museum of Fine Arts, the ICA, the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum, and the Harvard Art Museum jointly announced that they, they, they were also closing, closing their doors in observance of the CDC guidelines. Many academic galleries, along with commercial galleries and entire industries such as live performing arts have since followed suit. And like our gallery, many remain closed today. Most artists like Eben at the onset of this pandemic saw their studio spaces and exhibition opportunities become totally inaccessible as much of the world went into quarantine. Just two weeks later on March 27th, the Shelter in Place Gallery published its first post. It showed a, it showed a well used loft style studio space with vaulted ceilings, natural light that poured in from tall discolored window panes and realistic details such as water stains on the ceiling and warped loose foot floorboards. In the center of the space, a single framed artwork stood precariously placed on a low table. The post reads, welcome to SIP. With the, outgoing, with the ongoing shutdowns and lockdowns across the globe, artists are having to stay home and away from their studios. For most of us, that means just, just drastically less space to create. So I've built SIP Gallery as a new platform for Boston artists and eventually from all over to allow for large scale artworks to be made at a desk or a dining room table. Since, the op since opening to the public, the gallery has hosted over 50 exhibitions, all presenting new works made specifically for, for the space in miniature, acting as scale proposal, scaled proposals for exhibitions that are not physically, financially, or logistically possible in this time of social distancing, uh, a suffering a creative economy, and above all due to the shuttered public spaces, studios, museums, and other art institutions. In June, the gallery was awarded a small grant through Boston's now transformative public art program which has so far paid for artists shipping costs as well as, as a miniature stipend to cover material costs. The money they received has been instrumental in keeping this space completely free and accessible for artists that, have, that they present. The Shelter in Place Gallery has been operating since, accepting submissions online and coordinating, to, coordinating deliveries of artworks through the mail, then presenting images of their installations in the gallery on their website and on social media. Um, so what you see on the screen here is an example um, by artist Liz Nossiger um, entitled Grand Fury. And I just want to show a few other images um, just to give you a sense of that shift once you realize that the gallery space is in fact in miniature at a, at a um, uh, 1 to 12 scale. Um, you can see here Evan's hand um, placing some of the furniture that's in the gallery space. Um, and just to go back to that installation view, they really play um, very, you know, very smartly with the light, um, with, with the details of the textures and the painting um, of the different materials to really give you the illusion that's it's a true gallery space. 
Um, they also have, have posted images um, of the artworks in being placed in preparation for the installations, uh, as well as like, it's, it's very important to notice too on their online um, presence that the text um, also plays into the narrative of what they're trying to produce, um, often playing with humor and um, creating kind of like cheeky jokes around uh, museum, the museum industry and handling practices. So you can see that was the artwork prepared and then this is it installed in the gallery space. Um, and in this one, I really love this note where it says uh, an intern with three to five years experience um, would be really helpful for the installation. Um, as, as a curator, I'm always looking at how artists present and curate their own work and that of their peers. There's so much we can learn from how they, they creatively reimagine the ways artworks can be presented and conceptually framed. Artists run spaces such as this one, as well as artists, interventions and museums have had such an immense influence on curatorial practices. From the Salon de Refuse to Fred Wilson's Mining the Museum and re recent artist driven protests at the Whitney Museum of American Art and others, these interventions have highlighted inherent problems with elitism, racism, and financing in our arts institutions. In this way, artists have often led necessary institutional critique. They have forced institutions to look inward and reappraise the way that they tell their histories, how they collect and how they operate as, in as institutions. The shelter in place gallery has set the course of, of a new format and I find that I find really refreshing and exciting, uh, providing so many artists with access and an outlet for presenting exhibitions in this difficult time. I've been constantly surprised with the effect and the craft and the sculpture and photography in this artwork. It's trompe l'oeil illusion, illusions of space, material, light, and scale are really beautiful, uh, but the project is especially significant in its social impact. Uh, at this point, it's still developing history. I'm very excited to hear more about how it came about and what is next for the Shelter in Place Gallery. So with that, I would like to introduce Delaney and Dameron, uh, excuse me, Delaney Dameron and Evan Haynes. So thank you both so much for joining us tonight and, um, and telling us a bit about your work. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Of course. It's a great introduction. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, no problem. Share our screen. Here. Yeah, go ahead and share our screen. Um, if you want to just give me a heads up, Sam, that you can see that. All right. Once sure. I yep. it. Yeah, it looks great. Perfect. All right. All right. So I'm Evan Haynes from Sheltering in Place Gallery. <laughs> um, we are a 112 scale miniature gallery that puts on ambitious solo exhibitions by artists who want to make large scale works without the fine without the financial and spatial constraints generally associated with exhibitions of this size. Uh, my fiance Delaney and I started Shelter in Place at the beginning of the pandemic in early April when all the galleries and museums were shut down and and many of us artists didn't have access to studios. So that of course meant that we were unable to make our usual work and a lot of people were struggling to make things from home. Um, so making things on a miniature scale seemed like a good way to get around the issue of space constraints. Uh, since then, it's grown to be a place for artists to gather and show works addressing the myriad of social crises that for many of for many people have become suddenly clear with the onset of the virus and lockdowns. Um, so my day job, I'm a graphic designer for exhibitions at the Museum of Fine Arts and then after work, I go to the studio and <laughs> work for a few hours. Um, at, at SIP Gallery, I built the gallery. I'm kind of the voice on Instagram. I do much of the photography of exhibitions and I co-curate and choose shows with Delaney, my partner in this. Yes, Evan is definitely the, all the amazing humor that you hear and all the beautiful write-ups is all uh, absolutely uh, to credit of Evan, um, so very much the voice that you hear and you read when when you're uh, visiting SIP online. Um, I'm Delaney, Delaney Damron, co-founder as well. Um, my day job is that I'm a digital marketing consultant and project manager at Vital Design, so I work at a marketing agency doing a lot of digital project management. Um, at SIP, I do a similar work. Um, so I support Evan uh, with photography of exhibitions and, and selecting shows, um, but I also do a lot of the behind the scenes work, um, managing the exhibition calendar and planning, um, supporting artists with shipping and logistics. Um, you know, uh, Sam mentioned the grant uh, that we were lucky enough to get from the city of Boston, um, making sure that artists are uh, funded that grant um, so that the, their opportunity to show with us is free of cost. And then I also made the website. So um, 
outside of Instagram, uh, SIP also has a website um, just in case people didn't have um, Instagram accounts or um, wanted to be able to view the show from their desktops. Um, we went ahead and built a website um, that also has all of the shows that are available on the Instagram account online so you can browse through them uh, and find them more accessibly. Um, so let's talk about how it all started. Uh, to back up a little bit, I'll be the first to say that I am not a miniature artist. I have no real background in it. And yeah, didn't, didn't do a lot of this before this gallery started. Um, my first kind of foray into miniatures was for a show in Minneapolis called Art Fair, which was in July of 2018, uh, where several artists had their own 10 by 10 inch Art Fair booths that they were able to build out as they like, which there's a number of these. Um, on the screen. It was really freeing, I think, to have control over a space like that and to make these large scale works without all the usual difficulties around building them and, and more importantly, actually getting them to where they need to go. Um, so come late winter of 2019, I was pretty sick of riding my bike through the rain to get to a very cold studio. Um, so I started just going home um, after work and working on a model that could be used as a sort of backdrop to photograph my own maquettes and mock-ups of larger works. I was basically building like a dream studio that had everything that my current studio did not, including windows and tall ceilings and heat. Um, on the left is a very early stage pre-paint before I figured out how to do the roof. Um, <laughs> to the right is where I made a peaked roof and put in some windows. And the bottom right is where I left it off once the weather got nicer. Um, and after that, it sat collecting dust in my studio for probably about a year. Uh, everything in here you see is just foam core, map board, balsa wood, and acrylic paint. Um, <clears throat> when the pandemic started in March, I got furloughed from my job at the Museum of Fine Arts. And before lockdowns went into full effect, I moved most of my studio things out of my studio and into my apartment. Um, the sudden change in downsizing my studio combined with the general panic and anxiety around the pandemic was pretty paralyzing for me artistically. Um, I found that starting back in on this model was kind of a good way to keep my hands moving without necessarily making anything with emotional weight. Uh, it was fun and relatively mindless work. And so I figured that now that I was unemployed, I finally had time to make some miniature versions of the large installation works that I always have swinging in my head. Um, a room needs furniture. And so again, it was a good way to keep my hands busy without making art with a capital A. It was also surprisingly a really great way to jumpstart kind of my creative mind and get over the mental block brought about by everything. I'm not generally one who makes work that would be considered cute. Uh, so it was a pretty, pretty <laughs> big change of pace for me. Um, these again are all just matte board and acrylic paint. Um, I do have a, the chair so you can see to scale the size. <laughs> pretty small. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all made from just stuff around the house, matte board, paint, uh, the glass is from a plastic clamshell that had basil in it, and the <laughs> leather seat on the chair is from an old glove. Um, and then here's pictures of the finished room, complete, complete with the baseboards, beams, the poorly placed outlets, and all the <laughs> filth that might come from an abandoned brick box with a leaky skylight. Again, space is, the space is sort of what my dream studio might look like if I could afford it, and if that building hadn't already been turned into luxury condos. <laughs> Um, it was a major change of perspective for me as well, because making something so outside of my normal practice and it kind of felt safe to be working here when the outside world was kind of scary. So here is a photo of the outside of the gallery. So um, not as not as beautiful. <laughs> um, you can really see and get the perspective of the size and scale Though this is it sitting in its living room, uh, which is actually where we end up photographing many of the shows um, that you all see is us kind of pressing it against different windows in our house at different times of day, trying to capture light at the right moment. Um, you know, Evan mentioned it, but all of it was just pulled together from things around our house, you know, different plastic containers from things from the grocery store and, and map board. And, you know, the big piece for us was, you know, making it as convincing as possible with the details that were on the inside of the gallery. 
Um, but around the time that you can see getting to the point of completion that it, that it is in this photo, um, you know, Evan had been taking a lot of photographs of his own work in the space. And um, I think him and I were both kind of like shocked by how amazing it looked, like photographing it and how real it looked. Um, and kind of immediately we're like, do we have friends and family that want to use this to photograph some of their own, you know, works, maquettes or smaller pieces of work? You know, if anything, it can benefit them to have on their own websites or to share on their own social media, um, you know, with our community of friends and family that are artists, we thought, let's just reach out and see if people want to use it. Um, and pretty quickly, we were getting a lot of yeses. Uh, people wanted to, to jump in and, and use the space. Um, so here's uh, two of the first shows that we had. On the left is a piece by Andy Haynes, which is actually Evan's dad, um, who is a painter and lives in Boston. On the right are, are works by Brett Angel, um, who also works at the Museum of Fine Arts and, and lives in Boston. Um, so some of these initial shows we kind of got up and it was fun for us because it there was so many learning curves and that we had so many questions about like, what are we even really doing? Um, but, you know, playing with light, um, playing with kind of, I think, Evan's voice and how much we wanted to comment on the work and how much we wanted to leave it up to the artist just to, you know, write about their own works and, and should that be all we post uh, to the account. Uh, we played around with that a lot with the first few shows that we had, you know, kind of toying with what we wanted this to look like and, and what would be most helpful to artists, which at the end of the day was the goal. Um, but once we kind of got the first couple shows up from, from friends and family, like you see here, it picked up really quickly um, on Instagram and, and people seemed uh, to, to really like the idea. Whether they got it or not was also a big <laughs> piece. A lot of people thought it was just a real space. Um, and that was another piece we were trying to figure out is, is how obvious do we make the size of this? Um, how much do we want people just to believe it's a full size space? And how much do we want people to know that it's miniature um, with each works? I think we still play with that a lot. Yes. <laughs> um, so here are two um, more shows. So these are a little bit deeper um, into the actual, um, the space in the Instagram account. These are a few months in. On the left are works by Beach Hayab and on the right are works by Caitlin Ledford. Um, you know, around the time that, that we're really picking up traction, we were getting a lot more submissions and it became clear, you know, that there was a, a really heavy interest for this, um, even you know, as we started to near um, the end of a, a more uh, restrictive quarantine um, and more galleries started you know, to get innovative, we were still seeing a lot of submissions. And I think that was kind of when um, the gears started turning for Evan and I that, you know, I think there, that we think that there was a need for not only a gallery during quarantine, but also a gallery that's just more accessible to artists. Artists just need to be able to show their work um, and the accessibility of working on a small scale like this um, at the price points, you know, of creating works at this size, as well as the, the ease of shipping and logistics and the ease for Evan and I to hang it, photograph it and take it down within a few days. Um, all those different accessibility points, um, artists found really attractive. Um, and so we were getting a lot of submissions and, and yeah. found that really exciting. I think at the same time, a lot of people were excited to see something that wasn't just a white cube sort of gallery. And um, the fact that like this space is entirely false, but by rejecting this kind of white cube, it leads to a surprising feeling of reality, especially when compared to the virtual shows that are trying to fill the gallery void at this time, it, it was a little bit more exciting. So in acknowledging the kind of deceit of the miniature environment, um, I guess we were able to let people in on the joke and kind of allow them to interact in a more meaningful way, which hopefully made it a more accessible way to view it and what would, especially art that would generally be considered like kind of hard art. Um, and, and while you're know. while you're discussing uh, submissions and the attraction that artists had to applying, um, we have a good question from from Nick Hart, um, which is how many submissions do you receive a month and is it very competitive? That's a good question. <laughs> per month, I'm not sure. We received probably um, a few hundred submissions, so probably, you know, 20 something a month since we started. That's yeah. inaccurate. Um, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, about <laughs> to, I, don't, I don't know. It was it was like a lot at the beginning and then a dip and then it and then a lot, a lot, a lot yeah. <laughs> in the middle. So it's, it's hard, waves. Yeah. hard to say. Um, ebb and flow. Yeah. yeah, but no, it's we we are lucky in that we, because things are more 
we, we can do things so much faster than a regular gallery that we are able to show a lot more artists at a time, which makes it a slightly less competitive submission process. Right. I'll say too about the like competitiveness of it, if that if that's what you want to call it. But with the with the, the submissions we get, I mean, we're honored that people want to show in our space and and ex so excited that artists um, want to be in our space. The biggest thing Evan and I are looking for, and we write about it on our website, is you know we're really trying to support the Boston community first. Um, we're really trying to support causes that we care about and arts that um, are supporting those causes or, or trying to depict issues that are important to us. Um, and then thirdly, we're really looking for pieces that utilize the whole space. Um, you know, that I feel like that's the biggest challenge with some submissions is, is trying to have shows that are really impactful visually and then meaningfully, um, as well as, you know, just how it works in, in our space. Um, so, I, you know, I'll say it's maybe competitive in that way, but it's really just that we're, we're really trying um, with a large amount of effort to, to align with our values and then, you know, find pieces that are really uh, going to be a good fit in the space. Yeah, and, and the level of preparation that's been put into the proposals and the execution of the artwork has, has been really surprisingly super, super high since it's the amazing. very beginning. Like people have just been... <laughs> putting so much work into this stuff, which is so humbling and wonderful to see. Yeah. Um, at first, we kind of assumed that it was due to the amount of time that people had during lockdown. Um, but even as the country has sort of opened back up and, and galleries have started their regular programming again, I, that seriousness and dedication hasn't really wavered at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it hit us that this is potentially not a solution for a short-term problem of quarantine, but more the long-term problem of accessibility right. for artists to be able to show their works in galleries, especially in Boston. Right. Yeah, I was really struck, um, you know, reading some of the past interviews that you've had, and you even mentioned it too, designing it intentionally not to be a white cube gallery space, um, <laughs> of just the kind of social commentary. And like I mentioned in the intro, like the institutional crit critique um, that's, you know, kind of inherent in the project. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, personally, I kind of feel that White Cube can steal a lot of the, the personality out of work just by, you know, when, when you see artwork in an actual space, it, you, you understand that artwork is meant to be lived with and is meant to live with human beings. And that's kind of how it works and in the White Cube. It, it's oftentimes kind of a vacuum that pulls mm -hmm. that out. And that's, I think, so pertinent in the design um, that Evan put into the space and building it, but you can feel that it, it's a space for humans with the inconvenient, you know, plugs and the leaks and the skylight. It feels like humans are here in this space. And, and or have been there before. Yeah, at one point. Now. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, uh, so cruising along here, um, we wanted to just include some some works that we were um, especially, you know, really proud to show, but I think also really show um, the scale of work that so many of the artists were working on within the size of this space. So um, this show that we're looking at is Nicole Dunenbeer. Um, these are incredibly delicate, you know, Dutch still life paintings and up close, which is, you know, really quite small. Um, they're full of methane bubbles and dead flowers and rotting fish. And they're just these incredibly detailed, beautiful, beautiful pieces of work. Um, you know, and also pretty gross at the same yes. time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, around this time, you know, spring had come and, you know, I think Evan and I were always trying to find ways to have, you know, fun elements showing within the space, you know, as, as additional commentary to the work, but you can see we have some flowers that we picked, you know, just from the grass outside and that's uh, actually a mechanical pencil eraser lid thing <laughs> holding the flowers, um, but just kind of playing with what we can use, you know, to continue to kind of add playfulness um, or additional elements to the space um, with different shows that we were yeah. having. And it was definitely kind of like a diary situation where, you know, it was, we were doing this every single day. And so every day had to be a little bit different because every day was so the same <laughs> for so many people in the midst of the lockdown. Definitely. Um, you already mentioned it, Sam, but one of the kind of pieces that has become kind of a, a, a big element of, of SIP Gallery is the pictures like we're looking at here. 
um, for many of the people listening in and, and Sam as well, you've probably figured out already that um, most of our shows are almost exactly four days long um, and almost every show includes an install shot. Um, it was something we kind of did early on is I think kind of like you said, um, playing fun at institutions and, and how things are packaged and handled and shipped and, and installed and um, trying to continue that conversation here even in the miniature scale. Um, and as we played with that, you know, we had artists actually just volunteer themselves to, they wanted to make crates and they wanted to, to play. Um, and they found it really, you know, a creative opportunity to, to package their work in these miniature scales. Um, you know, some of the artists said that creating crates like this is, uh, took the same amount of time as building full-size crates. Um, and, you know, it, I think it provides that element of realism. It also allowed us, you know, to have that additional commentary and voice on other elements of the art world. Um, and I think it's just a lot of fun for viewers um, to yeah. be able to see that, that install process. But it also importantly creates that kind of sense of closure that you usually get with a show, you pack it up and it's all ready to go. And, and during quarantine, nobody was getting that kind of end point to the work they were making. So. So making these tiny crates was a great way to get that. Mm -hmm. And we included a, a few more shots here because we're obsessed with them. We get so excited when we open a box that gets delivered to us and, and find there's many crates or the work's uh, been packaged up by, by the artists. Um, Megan Hep on the left built this crate and wanted it to look like it had been left outside all winter since she wouldn't have been able to store the works in her house because they were too big. Um, you know, just so many fun pieces of commentary that each of the artists had and unique perspectives for each of their shows as they, as they packed them. Yeah, and that's really interesting in terms of like, uh, you're saying like getting into the detail of realism, just because that's even a detail that most, most of the public never actually sees in any institution, right? Yeah, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. And, and especially with the, the uh, furloughs and things that were happening, I know that it was a lot of art handlers and a lot of people who do all this behind the scenes work were the ones who were suddenly out of work and are also oftentimes artists who were doubly out of work because all of their shows were canceled. So mm -hmm. it was a way to kind of just bring attention to that behind the scenes aspect. And it definitely continues the story. I think so much of it is storytelling and that's what Evan does an excellent job of, but each show has its own story from the time we receive it and unpack it and how it's installed and how it plays with the light and the space, um, you know, with the additional commentary from the artists. And I think it just really plays into that story and it's really fun for, for the readers or viewers or followers or whatever. Yeah. So, so <laughs> everyone <laughs> as, as they uh, get to join these shows. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through kind of my, my regular full size practice, um, and what they're all about. Cause obviously a lot of that informs the aesthetics of the gallery and kind of how we run things. Um, so a lot of my paintings are these sort of anti-portraits that use the same visual language of portraiture, but much less about the sitter and more about their relationship to whatever's happening in the background. Um, I really kind of like these anonymous portraits cause in probability like the vast majority of portraits that exist in the world are of anonymous people made by anonymous people proving that no matter how wealthy or revered they were that the marks we make on the world are pretty quickly erased um, so instead of these being kind of monuments to individual status they're more questioning the like effectiveness basically of a system that perpetuates this battle between between haves and have-nots um, so there, are, these figures all kind of live in these false narratives where everything feels real until you notice the construction and the shadows on the wall and um, kind of, they're about like how limiting our American ideal of individualism is. Um, so the isolation and kind of lack of face-to-face -face interaction brought on by the pandemic just reinforced this uh, thematic trajectory. Um, on the left is a painting that I finished in July in my uh, little makeshift apartment studio. <laughs> and on the right is a work in progress that I'm doing right now. Um, most of my paintings use this kind of traditional posture and composition and by removing the face or by removing the clothing and making their faces unidentifiable, um, the sitter no longer kind of has this indication of class or social standing. Um, in these two particular ones that reverse the figure completely, so we're looking at their backs. But in all cases, it, 
the sitter becomes really unimportant uh, from the outset. And instead, we're thinking of our past associations with portraiture, and we're also forced to look at the background and see how the kind of depth created by paint is, is undone by the shadows on the wall. Um, it all becomes really flat, and the figures are kind of trapped on a stage set with their nose inches from the background. Um, and I think in our pandemic world, the narrative of like, you know, American opportunity becomes glaringly false when we see how easily it crashes, um, especially thanks to bad leadership and bad systems. Um, there's a couple older works from 2016 when I first started thinking about this kind of blind viewing uh, with figures inside in front of a stage backdrop. Um, again, here I was thinking about like, false opportunities and the kind of student desk debt crisis that we're still dealing with, um, where these people are just banging their heads against a dream. <laughs> um, and then these two were made a few years apart. You have snake oil developer on the left and rent during quarantine on the right, uh, which is actually a miniature work. Um, but pre and post pandemic, you know, food, shelter and healthcare, which should be human rights that our government refuses to uphold and instead allows people like developers to profit off of the quote revitalization of poor and working class neighborhoods. Um, and so it's kind of these mystics, you know, selling, selling is bad medicine. Um, and it, again, it's, it's against <laughs> this like individualist mindset where we're taught to take care of ourselves, even if it hurts others, which is all very cynical, I know, <laughs> but. But Evan, it's, it's interesting for you to say, you know, like you mentioned that there was a stage backdrop in that previous image um, and that there's so many connections between, uh, the, you know, your painting work and, you know, this, this breakdown of illusion and space and an existence in space and like what it means to exist in a space and to either be faced towards the viewer or against, away from the viewer or in, uh, in a bit of like a di dialogue that breaks down um, those traditional roles um, that is clearly very, very connected. Yeah, thanks, absolutely. And, and a lot of it is about like uh, how space becomes, or how space changes when we, when we digitize our, our personalities. Mm -hmm, which is what everybody's going through right now. <laughs> I mean, even, even in this medium here. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's, um, you know, you mentioned that you made some of these works in your home and um, Nicholas Rivas asked a good question about that. Um, he asked what's maybe what uh, positive aspects you found um, creating work in your living space instead of your, instead of a studio space. Um, well, the, the gallery, <laughs> the, gallery the fact that I sure. was able to work on kind of more things at once than I usually am at the studio was great. Um, and the fact that I was, for the first time in my life, able to do nothing but do artwork all day um, because I was unemployed, um, which is great. I, I will say that I have a hard time kind of separating working and living if I'm doing it in the same place. So having a studio and even just having like the bike ride to the studio where I can kind of do like a walking meditation sort of on the way there helps a lot with my process. So working from home, I think was pretty difficult for me. Um, you know, I had all this time and didn't know what to do with myself. So, <laughs> so a lot of that went into the gallery and that was a really great way to, to kind of separate those two ideas. We also, there was one other kind of related question that we actually got by email um, and it's from Brett Angel. Um, and he asked, so far the SIP gallery seems like a very separate thing from your personal work. Um, as a practicing artist, you envision incorporating your miniature builds into your own artwork in the future. Um, yeah, and hey, Brett. Um, <laughs> we saw his, his work in one of the earlier slides. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's sort of this separation between Eben the artist and Eben the, the gallerist, <laughs> um, which I like because it does give me kind of a, I don't know, another uh, mm -hmm. uh, personality to work from. <laughs> it's just using your creativity in different ways, yeah. I think. Um, but, but definitely, I mean, now in a, in a little while, you'll see some of the ways that my miniature stuff has kind of worked its way into my full-size stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so 
Yeah. 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 Feel free to keep going. Well, then we'll just we'll power on. <laughs> um, so, uh, aside from the actual content of my imagery, I think a, a ton about the actual like object quality of of the my paintings. Um, which, as I was saying, like so much of art is viewed online right now. And so the actual like thingness of a painting is reduced to a glowing image on our shiny pocket boxes. Um, so I, to me, this kind of creates a barrier between art and life. And so I try to create a kind of lived experience for my paintings, um, which you see in the kind of worn quality or the things are kind of broken and, and, and used. Um, I started working on this folding paper because at, at the museum um, we make a lot of design mock-ups for things and it's kind of devastating to throw all this nice paper into the recycling bin once, once the actual graphics go up. Uh, so I started taking the mock-ups home to paint on the back sides of them. Um, but in order to get them home I had to fold them up to put them in my bag. And so they ended up having this three-dimensional quality that I really liked. Um, so now once the painting's done, I, I usually fold it back up to get this kind of like road atlas look to it. And sometimes I even carry them around with me to get the kind of wear marks and the, this feeling of, of, of being used and being lived. Um, my drawings are, are a little bit different. They're done in acrylic and, and graphite with a layer of latex on top, which is another way that I kind of try to create this aged quality. Um, Latex is a really interesting material because uh, it's a really temporary material. Um, as it ages, the water content kind of evaporates and leads to like a hardening and darkening of the material, which eventually becomes really brittle and kind of unable to support itself. So if, if anybody who knows the work of Ava Hesse, if you look at her pictures of her sculptures from the 60s versus what they look like now, you'll see that they're dark and hard and kind of weird, but still in a very beautiful, <laughs> beautiful way. Um, and so doing these kind of Roman bust portraits with the skin of latex over top of it, um, I, I know that over the course of the next 20 or so years, these images will like start to degrade and become a lot harder to read. Um, and 20 to 30 years is also the approximate average amount of time that Roman senators served and also the amount of time that most senior members of Congress have been in power in the US. Um, so it's about this kind of degradation of power over time. Um, and because these are pretty small, I usually like to show them kind of as a collection. And I'm really interested in a lot of the complexity behind museum furniture in, in that you know, it protects the work from the elements, but at the same time, these protective boxes create like a very static environment for the work um, that's often like the museum's pretty resistant to ideological change. And it serves as this kind of buffer between art and life. So as a museum worker myself, I'm often confronted with this dichotomy that between uh, what's more important, protecting the work for the future or enjoying the work in the present. And so these works, kind of try to bridge that gap a little bit. Um, the one on the left is actually a miniature display case. And then the one on the right is uh, something that I made for a group show at 13 Forest Gallery in July. Um, so that all leads to my, my long awaited show at Shelter in Place Gallery, um, where I got to kind of put all this stuff together and, and, and and fulfill the original intent of this space <laughs> um, before it was a gallery. So most of the paintings in here are things that I would generally need like assistance and forklifts and a manager to produce. Um, they're done on giant sheets of lead and tied to steel plates and sitting on cut up chairs and there's an antique cabinet. See the nice size here for scale. <laughs> antique cabinet filled with dirt and debris and um, so especially during the lockdown, it was like a really great exercise to kind of recapture some of the motivation to start making my own work again and to start making full-size work uh, while I was still in my temporary apartment studio. Um, here you can see another miniature and its real life counterpart. Um, and then you can see 
on the left in some of my miniature works, some of the interventions I've taken to try and incorporate kind of living objects into these static uh, museum pieces. Um, in July, I was selected to recreate one of my miniature works in full scale as part of the Area Code Art Fair, uh, which was really exciting. And I installed it in the loading dock in Southie. Um, it was my first installation work at a full scale, so I learned a ton, um, <laughs> mostly about like how to build something pretty big that you can still lift with two people, uh, how to not pile black dirt behind glass and then put it in a sunny place because <laughs> it ended up just being a mirror for <laughs> most of the time. Um, and it was also a really good reminder that, that once things leave the studio, they get a lot smaller. <laughs> And I'm just curious, just because of, uh, I'm really interested in all your connections to the to um, these, you know, backroom spaces like at the museum and just like in general in the art world. Um, just whose loading dock that is? Oh, so this was uh, it's in South. It's on it was 10 Old Colony Road. Um, so I think with Art Fair. Uh, uh, oh, area no. code. Yeah, with area code. Um, they worked with Space Us to get uh, like storefronts in various other unused spaces around the city. So I think this was this building was under construction or under renovation, and it's going to be uh, uh, a brewery? some brewery. Yeah, yeah. a brewery. Oh. But so it's it's those art or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, that'd be cooler. <laughs> uh, no, it was just this big unused um, space that had a bunch of construction going on behind it, but it had big doors so it could be locked up at night. So I thought it'd be a good spot. Yeah. Great. Do you have um, much more slides um, or should we open it up to the Q&A in just a few minutes? Um, we have a few more. I think we can probably skip through group show stuff yeah. and go towards future planning. Um, we had included just some brief shows. Yeah, you know. just a, a couple, you know, let you <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, girls like Levon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this so, was also through our art, art, area code art fair um, that we had in gallery stuff. Exactly. So just um, from a high level to give some more context about what we do at, at SIP, um, we've additionally outside of just having um, opportunities for artists to have solo exhibitions, um, we have um, worked on a few different group show opportunities. Um, so we highlighted just in a few slides here specifically um, working with curators and kind of what that looks like um, for SIP as well. Um, so here you can see through the Area Code Art Fair we worked with Ellen Tani. Um, she guest curated a series of shows that began with Levon Jenkins. Um, it goes through and we had Elizabeth Atterbury. I'll go kind of quickly since we want to kind of cruise through here. Susan Metrican and Sachiko Akiyama as well. Um, which has been an amazing opportunity for us to have a show where we get to have a lot of different touch points or various shows where we get to have a lot of different touch points and potentially reach artists that um, we wouldn't have otherwise had the opportunity to work at within our space. Um, so different kind of different curatorial opportunities. Um, and if any curators are listening, we do love to work with curators as well um, to, to create you know, different aspects and visions for this space. Yeah, it opens us up to a lot of things that the submissions just are unable to. So right. Definitely. meet a lot more people. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, in, in summary here, just kind of, I think like the big piece that Evan and I are just really proud of is as we look ahead to the future is just what we've been able to achieve so far. Um, you know, Sam, you've already mentioned, but we've been able to have over 53 exhibitions. We've been able to have over 65 artists show in our space. And that's after COVID, obviously that's why we started. So 65 artists have been able to show their works during uh, quarantine. Um, we've had hundreds of submissions. Um, you know, I think we have a really strong fo followership on Instagram and we have a lot of engagement on our website. Um, we just feel incredibly lucky that that people um, are so excited about this project, both people being artists, as well as curators, as well as um, just people who are interested in participating and having a conversation about art, especially art in Boston and what that means to them. And, and also, we're not the only people doing this, which is <laughs> exciting. Um, right. um, we've uh, talked to a lot of people who have kind of a lot of people actually ask us permission to make their own and we're like, yes, of course, please <laughs> absolutely do this. Every, every city should have at least one of these. Um, so some of our favorites were Smalbany Gallery, which is in Albany, New York, and the Shoebox Gallery in Philadelphia. Um, 
which are both fantastic. And then actually predating us uh, by a couple of years is Flyweight Projects in New York, which is this phenomenal 112 scale gallery that um, kind of inhabits various galleries and storefronts around the city. And their work is always really, really excellent. Um, uh, Chris Lucius, who is a curator in New York, put together an awesome miniature show at the Royal Society of American Art in Brooklyn, which I was lucky enough to take part in, where he um, actually built these individual backdrops for everybody's work that looks like it was ripped out of some abandoned building, which is pretty incredible. Um, <laughs> so not only did he get really great art, but he also made these amazing backdrops. Um, yeah, and looking ahead, um, we teased at giving some additional information about things that are coming as we look ahead to the new year. Um, so first, um, we are having a show um, at the Southern Vermont Arts Center. Um, they're currently working on an exhibition called Unmasked uh, that will take part across multiple galleries that they have on their campus in Shelter in Place Gallery. We'll actually get to inhibit an, an entire gallery within their space, um, featuring eight artists that have shown with us. And it will have their miniature piece from their show with us, as well as a full-size piece. So you'll be able to see the scale that they were working at, um, the detail they were working at. And this will be an in-person show, obviously pending um, COVID restrictions where people can go see these works in person um, at the Southern Vermont Arts Center. That's really exciting. That's, it is. And that's yeah. mid-January to, to mid-March and we'll have more information up uh, in the future as we get closer to that show. Um, and then as you mentioned before, uh, the gallery itself has been acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts, which is really exciting. Um, and we're always really humbled by you know, people caring about this. <laughs> and yeah, so just uh, as a part of that announcement, you know, I think people have a lot of questions about what's happening specifically with SIP. So um, the MFA acquired the building. Um, so th they bought some real estate um, and that's SIP's real estate. Um, and what that means for us is that we um, will still be running SIP Gallery. We'll still have our website and our Instagram account. And we are con planning on continuing our regular programming. Um, and what that looks like is new construction for a miniature gallery, which I'll let Eben uh, tease out here for a few slides, and then I know we want to open it up to Q and A. But people yeah. love construction photos, right? <laughs> yeah, just give you some some sneak peeks. Uh, here it is with some flooring gone in. Uh, you can see it is now a four walled gallery instead of just three walls. The back wall being a removable uh, freight elevator door, which will be great for getting large works into the space. <laughs> Um, and for photography. And for photography. <laughs> um, here it is with the floors kind of aged and some patches put in over the rotten boards and then painted up. And then you can see the, the arduous process of scribing in a couple thousand mortar lines to make these brick walls. Um, this is still all just kind of unpainted foam core and map board at this point. Um, and then a couple close ups of the sort of forgettable aspects of the gallery. Uh, the doors and windows, um, which it, at least to me seems like oftentimes one of the most important things because when things look like they really belong there, you're able to just forget about it and the art can kind of take the focus instead of like some weird little thing in the background. You're like, oh, that looks fake. I don't, <laughs> this is all fake. Um, so I don't know. I think that's one of the most important aspects of the gallery and of, of making any kind of space look realistic uh, within the false digital uh, zone that we all <laughs> live in these days is that, you know, everything's as real as you make it. And so um, when, when things are able to be forgotten, that's when they really uh, become realistic. So hopefully once it's all painted and paneled and bricked and everything, we'll have something to rival the original. Mm -hmm. um, but also with operational windows and a wood stove and four walls. <laughs> That's so exciting. It looks like a really beautiful space. Thanks. Very excited. Yeah, I can't see what, what, what comes up next for you guys. And just before we start the q and I'm just curious, um, with the M MFA's acquisition, are they going to be sh uh, displaying it as uh, a standalone sculpture or are they planning to do any programming? So it? yes, they are planning to do programming in it. Um, there is a show that, uh, because of COVID stuff, keeps getting kind of pushed, but it's going to be a, a new acquisitions show paired with objects from the collection. And uh, Shelter in Place will actually have 
hopefully four separate shows during the run of that one big show that has um, a couple of uh, artists who have formerly shown with us will have works in it paired with uh, miniature works in the collection. Um, and then cool. after that, hopefully uh, they'll be able to tie it to some of their other programming to have um, at least biannual shows in the gallery in a miniature size. Fantastic. <laughs> That's really great. Yeah, congratulations again. That's you know that's that's huge. Um, thanks. Yeah, yeah. 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 big yeah. thanks to Michelle Miller, uh, one of the curators in the Department of Contemporary Michelle, Art. Michelle Ooh. Fisher. Michelle Miller Fisher. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got there. <laughs> who, who made all this possible? So yeah. yeah, and it's good. Even just in that moment, it shows you guys really complement each other in terms of uh, working. Trying <laughs> <laughs> to finish well. each other's sentences. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so fantastic. Yeah, thank you for that really, really insightful talk um, and like deep dive into all the different aspects of the projects and the future of, of, of the gallery. Um, so we're going to open it up to Q&A um, and we already have quite a few really great questions, but if you have anything else you want to, to ask um, Evan and Delaney, uh, feel free to put those in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and I'll just start off with a few um, kind of easier ones to, to answer really quickly. Um, and one anonymous attendee says, how big is the gallery roughly? Um, it is, the floor plan is 20 by 30 inches and then it's 17 and a half inches to the, to the peak of the roof and about 14 inches on the walls. Nice. So 500 square feet in miniature. Yeah, <laughs> right, and that, and that one to 12 means every inch is, is a foot. Yes. Represents a foot, right? Yeah. Great. So even um, as far as spaces go, it's still not that big of a space. <laughs> Um, I think that same attendee asked, do you repaint um, your mini paintings or are they digital digital prints? Um, so like for your solo exhibition, I think they're asking. Oh, that was that was all real. We mm -hmm. so we uh, we don't accept any digital reproductions of anything. Everything that's seen in the gallery is made at that scale and made specifically for whatever show it's in. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, no, nothing digital besides the photographs. <laughs> Um, my, uh, an attendee who's actually my sister asked a really great, great question. Um, Liz asks, did either of you have a dollhouse when you were younger? Did, did you ever build small worlds when you were younger? You, you, train guy. Yeah, well, so, <laughs> so at Christmas, the, the model trains would always go up, but that was oftentimes more a dad project than it was a, an Evan <laughs> project. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and then also I had a, a a dollhouse from my mom that lived with us for a little while but again I, I mean I like to set things up but mostly it was a thing for GI Joes to crawl over the roof and mm -hmm. but that, that gets at what she's saying right it's like this idea of like uh, you know how do you imagine or work um, mentally across like different scales you know in terms yeah. of play and, and also Delaney you mentioned play at, at one point um, during your talk and I thought that, that was really interesting and something that um, I've been noticing a lot a lot more artists and just um, you know friends and family members that I've been talking to finding ways of dealing with um, the restrictions that COVID has set on everyone is trying to find um, ways to just be able to play and experiment. Absolutely. Absolutely I think one of the one of the biggest benefits of of the world falling apart is that <laughs> is that we can finally take things a lot less seriously than we used to because you know, our social structure is broken down in so many ways that it's like we can, there's no more, there's no more uh, uh, restrictions on what we're allowed to do. <laughs> or, it's, or maybe it's just easier to, to reimagine worlds, yeah. right? Yeah. When we realized that ours was honestly quite fragile, right? Yeah. yeah. And you can try new things because, because it's all broken anyway, so why not? Yeah, totally. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Constantina Sedaris asks, after, after life returns to normalcy, which is in quotation marks, um, have you considered turning this miniature gallery into a life-size one or how um, will this project eventually morph? The plan for now is we'll continue to run SIP as a miniature gallery online as long as there's a demand for it. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly meeting a need for artists, I think, regardless of COVID because of its accessibility, um, it's free, it's, it's easy to show. Um, so as long as, you know, artists need this space, I think we will 
try our damnedest to to keep uh, SIP live uh, in a miniature form because it it in miniature form is what makes it so accessible uh, both to the artists and the viewers. Yeah, it's interesting you were mentioning the the show at the the Southern Vermont Studio um, or Art Center rather um, that they're showing uh, larger scale versions of the original um, submissions. Was that something that um, you would pr propose as like a curatorial choice or is that something that the curators there suggested? Yeah, that was an idea we had. We we thought it, you know, I think we've seen um, artists have different takes on their miniature shows, um, but the example I used when we were speaking with the curator at, at the SBAC was um, Monique Crabb, who is a quilt maker out of uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and she um, does hand quilted, hand dyed um, quilts, full size real quilts. Mm -hmm. um, and for the space, she created miniature quilts, these tiny, tiny quilts, just incredibly delicate and beautiful. Um, and in conversations with her, we knew that those quilts that she made that were miniature were actually, re she made reproductions of full size quilts. So we thought um, it'd be such a beautiful conversation visually to get to see her miniature work, her miniature quilt uh, speak with uh, the very large full size quilt that she made and, and see how um, I think each one tells its own story, but also how they speak to each other, even though they're, you know, they're the same piece of art with the same name. Um, but created in two completely different times uh, to be shown in different spaces. Yeah, and that's really great because it seems like it kind of realizes, um, you know, the mission, the overarching mission of of the gallery, right, is to not just have this space where people can envision these possibilities, but also maybe in a way encourage them to actually to to actualize them. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. On that on that note, um, Ryan McCarthy asks, do you believe miniature art is able to deliver the same level of detail and impression as a larger or moderate scale piece? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's hard. I think in in the digital world, yes, because everything is made miniature by either your phone or your computer screen. Um, but, well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, standing in front of some massive, massive piece of work um, has a wholly different feeling than standing in front of a sculpture that's as big as your fist. Mm -hmm. um, at that same time, though, I, I think it, it the the way that the work is made in the in the context that it's in um, miniature work, I think, can be just as powerful, mm -hmm. but it. It can't be, I mean, what we're doing is pretending to be something that it's not and miniature work mm -hmm. needs to stand on its own outside of a digital context. Mm -hmm. Right, and so it seems like you're kind of positioning that that illusion of, of the translation of the space through the digital photograph is, is like a really key element for you. Yeah. In terms of the impact. And yes. you know that uh, and a different perspective on the, the same piece of information or same conversation there, though, is that many of the artists who do make larger works as their general practice, who did create smaller works for SIP, um, you know, because of the feedback they got and also because I, they were able to sell that work, they said that they learned so much about their practice and that there was and such an and how to build things. But there was also an interest from the public because the price points were more accessible to them. They finally got to buy a piece of work from this artist who makes much bigger, more expensive pieces. Um, so it's actually, you know, making work on this small scale for our gallery opened the eyes of artists about how they can make their work more accessible as well. I think both price point and potentially accessibility for them to be able to make it from their homes and things. Um, but it definitely changes the dialogue and conversation about what art means, both for the person that's buying it and, and how accessible that is to them and then the artist that's making it. Mm. That's well put. Yeah, I, I'm curious too, just uh, uh, in a technical aspect, um, how did you get, what do you guys use to photograph with? Got a, <laughs> an iPhone uh, something. You have an yeah. SE maybe? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that seems <laughs> oh, kind of... <laughs> It seems kind of important, right? It's like, and also it almost seems like um, at that at that scale, the camera on the iPhone is uh, is almost at eye level. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, if you put if you put the phone down, that's a that's a five foot eight person, which is <laughs> what I am. So that's great. <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, we also found out pretty early on that like using an actual fancy DSLR camera um, because it has such a big lens and it has mm. that like. Uh, depth of field that nice cameras have 
it completely ruins the illusion and kind of looks like that filter that Instagram used to have that made things miniature. <laughs> um, so because the iPhone has such a tiny lens, it doesn't it doesn't skew things in the same way. And so the depth of field is pretty pretty straight through. Hmm. And you and you kind of mentioned um, the answer to this question a little bit um, in terms of like it, it kind of evolving over over almost more than a year. But um, one attendee asks, how long did it take to build? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Again, I was working on it just like in bits and but like really on, it was a rainy day project. And so it was probably a few months of that. And then um, once we went into isolation here, it was probably like a week and a half to, right. to finish everything and make it look pretty good. <clears throat> the the gallery we're working on right now, um, I would probably say once it's done, it's taken about a month mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. working relatively hard on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems like it's very, very detailed, uh, meticulous yes. uh, mark making and painting. Yeah, no, it all takes yeah. a long time. <laughs> um, Caroline Kipp asks, uh, what inspired the design of the new space? There are, of course, similarities, but for example, making sure you got the heating um, this time, having high walls, uh, wall windows versus skylight. Um, you could have just remade the first gallery, but you didn't, and that's interesting. I think there was, well, I'll let you speak to some of it, but I think um, I'll, I'll say a lot of it was the uh, us continuing the conversation of playfulness in the story, but met, uh, a lot of, uh, our posts when the original gallery are us complaining, <laughs> um, you know, about how we wished we had a bigger door or freight elevator and our gallery is really cold. And so I think when Evan and I were talking about it, we we're like, we've got to have a freight, ele freight elevator. We need a wood stove. It's so cold in there and drafty. Well, yeah, now that it's winter, the first one came in, <laughs> in spring, so it wasn't so bad. Yeah. Uh, so just like kind of what have we, what conversations have we started around where we could have improvements that, that we should have here? Um, and then the other piece is that um, when it was built, when Evan built it, it um, was not built to be photographed at the amount that we need to photograph it. So we actually have to like rearrange our whole living room every time we shoot a show because um, we press it against the window. So we like move all the plants and the chairs. Um, so this one, the windows are on the correct side. So hopefully we don't have to rearrange our living room every time we photograph the show. Yeah, it's everything's kind of rearranged to make, to make uh, setting it up quickly more easily. So the and the doors, the double doors that you can see in the background there, those actually are removable. So there's two places to get your hand in to photograph things. Um, and the windows are placed in a way that you can't see the the like our actual windows in the living room, um, which was always an obstacle trying to angle the gallery the right way. So you can't you can only see outside. Um, so it's a lot of just kind of technical and and um, things to, to make it easier on us. Mm -hmm. So both utilitarian and then also playing into the narrative um, yeah. that you've kind of been writing of, of, of the of the staff of the guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, need, we need a warmer place with operable windows. Mm -hmm. Do you think there'll ever be a, a, a day when you'll um, add any members to your staff? If, if, if the program, you know, as much as I'd love <laughs> to have help, yeah. I, I doubt it. Because it's, yeah. it's, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's a project, it's not a business, it's not. Yeah, we don't make any money at all off of this. Yeah, so. we do it after work and on the weekends and, yeah. or before work, I should say, as well, when the light's better. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't uh, see anybody helping us just because it would be difficult logistically uh, with it's our just with a our lot of work. It's a lot of work, <laughs> and it's just a project. Or it's not just a project, but yeah, it's it's not a business. So I think it'd be also difficult logistically to hire somebody. <laughs> right, right. Um, this is just kind of a funny uh, comment from uh, Audrina Warren, who says, "Love the wood stove, but curious what a metal forced uh, water radiator would have looked like." With a little, wink, <laughs> little wink emoticon. <laughs> um, John Tyson asks, uh, so he's got a, a few different questions. He says, how is scale different to size? Um, and he also wonders if uh, you got any um, app submissions that were 3D printed come to you. Um, we so answering the, sec <laughs> yeah, sorry, answering the second one, um, our, our uh, Cliff Banquet show actually had some 3D printed objects in it 
um, and which, an artist from Craft Show, right? And an, yes, uh, nailed it. Yes, um, an artist from our Craft Show also made these beautiful uh, uh, 3D printed uh, ceramics. Yeah, that were pretty awesome. That's Jolie No No. Um, yeah, she's pretty awesome. What was the first question? Um, uh, First yeah. question was, what's like? How do you see the difference between scale and size? Um, well, I guess I mean scale. Scale assumes that it is the right size, but shrunk <laughs> or grown, um, as opposed to yeah, because we don't really think about things in terms of like like how big is this, how big is that, is that going to fit in the gallery? It's more about like if that was, how do we make that look 12 feet tall mm -hmm. in the gallery mm -hmm. as it would in life? So it's like relational to the intended object. Yeah. Right. right. Yes, that's a much better way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Liz asks regarding accessibility, not that there is a, you know, a box for art consumers to fit in, um, but have you heard from fans of the gallery that are outside the typical art gallery consumer, um, like art world, uh, any surprises in, in relation to those re responses? Um, I think, well, I, I don't come from the art world at all. Um, and I think something that I, in my conversations with Evan about his own personal work and as well as the gallery is, is trying to say like, do I understand what the joke is or what we're talking about? Um, because I have a business degree and I was an athlete growing up and I just had very little exposure um, to the art world, um, especially the inside jokes about, you know, the inner workings of museums and galleries. So um, trying to make sure both, you know, that, that the conversation we're having is accessible to people like me, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but as well as, um, with his personal work, you know, the, the symbolism behind it and how you're telling those stories is something that I feel like I can digest and that I understand, um, not, not in any way because I'm not smart, but it's just without an art background and education and um, experience in the industry, um, trying to make sure that um, people don't feel as intimidated as I think so many people feel when they walk into a gallery and into a museum, um, that we give context to everything that we're doing and that it's telling a story that is, is easy to digest. And if you want to go deeper, you can, yeah. but it, it feels accessible. And it's also the fact that, that, uh, we kind of meet things out. So, so, you know, it starts with the install shop and then you have like an overall and then you kind of get deeper into it. But in that way, you can just take these sort of bite-sized or, sips of, <laughs> of this work and kind of uh, wrap your head around kind of more difficult concepts, especially I think also the fact that it is tiny and you know at, in the back of your mind that like this is the size of my fist so it's like something conquerable in some ways. Um, That's scary. That it is less conquerable when you when you paid money to go look at something that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there there is a lot in there, uh, a lot of inside jokes, um, you know, that I, that I just you know just being working in the art world um, for many years, you know, see right away from like the loft space that you know in New York was already kind of inaccessible as a gal as a studio or gallery space for artists in the '90s, and in Boston probably even uh, probably about like 15 years ago, um, and just all you know things that you mentioned too in in the comments and the posts um, and the materials that are used. Um, but it does seem like it's still very accessible to most of the public. And, and I think, uh, you know, that's been on one hand, the response from the press, um, it being this, you know, thing that is pretty accessible and like uh, uh, also very kind of exciting and entertaining, um, but also has a lot of really deep content in it. Like you were talking about, um, you know, about the idea of uh, people, of artists being kind of forced out of their spaces um, due to uh, gentrification um the the fact that it stands in this place for artists who otherwise might not be able to get exhibitions um even during even you know before covid um just in the way that most spaces are required to operate and the fact that you've shown you know i think you said 65 artists in nine months time um you know that's lightning fast that's really incredible and then you know when you're talking about accessibility and representation that's you know much more equitable than most spaces are actually able to be to um, to be so, you know, kudos on that. Thanks. Yeah. 
Um, so I think, you know, unless anybody has any last minute questions or if there's anything else that you two want to touch upon, um, I think we're kind of naturally coming to a close of the program. Is there anything else um, you two would like to say? Thanks for having us. Sorry for being a little long winded. <laughs> no, no, please. It was really wonderful. It's great to see, you know, um, so many different aspects of the work and for you to share, um, you know, the futures of the gallery space and the fact that, um, you know, this, this project really is going to have legs for what seems like a long time. Um, and I hope that this ma is maintained too, um, even after, even after the pandemic ends, which hopefully will become, will be soon. Um, <laughs> So yeah, thank you both so much for, for your time. And thanks for everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm Sam Toby uh, signing off for the University Hall Gallery. And this was Eben Haynes and Delaney Dameron um, of the Shelter in Place Gallery. Uh, thank you both. And um, thank you. everybody take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.